Um, so Vanessa, I think I've got a few slides. They're just a few pictures of some old machines. <laughs> so you don't just have to look at my face. Um, so yeah, I'm Alice. Uh, I am a co-director at the Climate Change Charity Possible. Uh, I head up the comms team and I co-run the organisation because we're a bit unusual. We don't have one executive director. There's four of us that share that job. We kind of shave the pointy bit off the top of our hierarchy. To something I highly recommend to any other organisations who might be thinking about their, their hierarchical or non-hierarchical structures. But that's slightly side to the side. I've been spending a lot of the last year uh, not working at Possible and um, on being part-time writing a book about the history of the climate crisis. It's coming out this summer with Bloomsbury Sigma. It's called Our Biggest Experiment and obviously you should all buy it. Um, and a big part of that book is kind of me thinking how did we get into this mess? It is the story of how we built um, huge, you know, how we found ever more elaborate ways to burn fossil fuels, really. Uh, but not just how we, we came to burn fossil fuels, but how we came to do energy in a particular way. So Phil just thought, really interesting to, to see, um, you know, the distinctions he was drawing at the end between kind of a militarized energy system and a peace one. There's, that's just one way in which there are different ways of doing energy, apart from just this kind of uh, sort of fossil fuels and other, other or other um, renewables or nuclear, the, the kind of uh, other distinctions that generally get described to us. Uh, the things like community ownership, that's something we do a lot of work on, on possible versus ownership, you know, by, is it owned by the state? Is it owned by different companies? Is it owned by multinational companies? And when you trace back through the history of particularly things like the oil industry, it's so fascinating to see. I mean, groups like the ones that sort of came out roughly of the UK, like Shell and BP, are so particularly interesting from how they are not just the UK, but multinationals and the way in which multi un, sort of modern notion of multinationals kind of emerged with the, the, the fossil fuel industry, first in the 19th and then the 20th century. Um, also, the shifting roles of the unions, and particularly something that I find is, is so important for my work at Possible is that um, the way in which the public were often just in, almost encouraged not to pay any attention to this huge transformation. The last few hundred years, we've had these incredible changes uh, in, in our in our lives because of the burning of fossil fuels. Um, all sorts of benefits brought to us, as well as huge amounts of pollution and human rights problems and all sorts of other uh, awful things that happen around fossil fuels. Um, but also some incredible bits of engineering. I mean, like just the, um, the things that we have done as people together collectively to build uh, it's quite awe-inspiring now sometimes it's awe-inspiring in a kind of terrifying way rather than a yay that's great but some of it's also pretty yay that's great as well and yet the public has kind of been almost almost encouraged not to pay attention to it and there's a, there's a nice thing about that it's very liberating in some ways that you can just flick a switch and then you have light and heat and you don't read and movement and you you don't have to think about all these other things because there are other clever people thinking about it but then when it comes to the problem we have today of the climate crisis and we're asked to change that system the public are very disempowered when it comes to how they to understand how to be part of that change or what those different changes might look like um, and that's the struggle that I hit up against every day at possible I often say the biggest challenge for me isn't public engagement or disengagement with climate science but with our energy system um, and so a lot of this, this book writing has been kind of how we made this terrible thing but it's also been about how we did also find some great resources and build some great great useful things and so us as uh, citizens in the 21st century might feel that we have inherited an almighty mess and in many ways we really really have but we also have inherited some great tools and so this is just what i'm going to do a very short whistle stop tour through uh, a bit of a theme in my book which is um some of these tools that we have uh, and some of the history of, of of energy production that isn't through fossil fuels uh, but this doesn't mean it's necessarily good and that it all comes from a good place. One of the things I want to, to stress is that these things are as complicated and sometimes they're slightly icky um, and difficult and entangled with the rest of society as, as the fossil fuel uh, story has been. So you start here with a picture. We have uh, Cragside in, uh, in the north of England, a bit north of Newcastle. Some of you might have been here. It's a National Trust property. It was built by a man called uh, William Armstrong in the 1870s. Now he was an arms dealer. He made a lot of money. I think he managed to sell guns to both sides of the American Civil War. Uh, he, sold a, he made a lot of guns for uh, the Crimean War. His company also specialized in hydraulics and they built the hydraulic systems for Tower Bridge. So I was 
going for a jog past Tower this morning. If you've ever seen it raised, thank you, uh, William Armstrong. And in the 1870s, kind of took semi-retirement um, to build this sort of castle, basically, um, up in the north of England. And he was he was only semi-retired. So he wanted somewhere that he could show. He had visiting dignitaries from from abroad. He wanted to buy his guns, and uh, he wanted to show off. Uh, so he had beautiful. He built this beautiful castle uh, with this beautiful, with beautiful grounds got William Morris wallpaper and also he loved to tinker he was an engineer and he, he used it as an opportunity to have some of his more wilder inventions in fact this building was actually used as a set for a, a mad scientist um, castle in one of the Jurassic, uh, Jurassic Park movies um, and he got his friend Joseph Swan to give him some of his new uh, light bulbs because electric lights had been kind of pioneered by people like Humphrey Davy at the beginning of the 19th century but the arc, this was arc lights and it was incredibly bright, bright so people some people in Paris would sometimes have arc lights because they wanted to show off how modern they were but you'd have to have an umbrella to shade your eyes it was so bright um, and William Swan had developed this light bulb that worked with uh, light from heat which was much softer light um, and uh, William Armstrong thought that he would have that in his house and he'd show off. And so if you were a Central European prince coming to see if you were going to buy guns, you'd be impressed by this man who had these incredibly modern light bulbs. And to power these light bulbs, instead of having a coal burner in the basement, which is how a decade later Edison would first sell his electric light systems to people like J.P. Morgan, um, he's had, he set up a hydro system and it was the first hydroelectric system. Uh, with one of the, the streams and the National Trust actually rebuilt that recently so if you go go to visit this when it reopens again um, you can see the hydroelectric system working there. Um, now it wasn't long after that that hydro started to get a lot bigger it wasn't just building you know powering one person's uh, very slightly madcap idea of electric light bulbs uh, but things like Niagara. Uh, Niagara a falls was probably the first really big electricity system anywhere. So people often say to me when I'm talking about things like electric cars in the turn of the century, which was a totally big thing. Everyone thought the future of the car was going to be electric back in 19, uh, 1900. And when I'm saying to them, oh yeah, electricity used to be the future for transport back 100 years ago, they're like, oh yeah, but it was all coal powered. Well, actually, the first electrons down the line from Niagara in uh, 1896 were powering the, the trolley buses in Buffalo. And it wasn't until a few weeks later that it started powering the lights. Um, and there was um, also in, you could take an electric powered tram to the Giants Causeway in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, so there, there was the, the first big electricity project, Niagara Falls was renewable. So it's worth remembering that. Even if you're uh, not someone who's pro hydro, it's, it's something that's really important to remember, I think. I also just want to say a little bit about solar. So can I have the next slide? Uh, solar started around the same time, so lots of people. Oh, well, sorry, that's the first. Um, that's the first uh, power plant in Niagara. Um, what it looked like. So next one. Um, uh, solar people always, you know, went from the first times that people started. People like Devons, who policy energy policy nerds will know from the Devons paradox uh, in the mid 19th century, talk about the danger of of kind of peak coal and running out of coal and uh, and how. A, any attempt at being more efficient in energy, uh, like new developments in steam engine, just led to us making more for ways of, 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 of using coal. People like that would still dream of getting energy direct from the sun. There was this kind of sense that in the future, we will have energy direct from the sun. And this is an example of people trying to do this uh, around the same time as Armstrong was mess uh, messing around with his hydro plant. This is from the World Fair in Paris in 1878. And it was a printing press that ran on steam solar. So that big funnel kind of concentrated the sun and that would heat water, which would then turn into steam and it would turn uh, a, turb a turbine. And um, that actually powered a printing press that made a special magazine. Even on a cloudy day, it managed to have 500 copies an hour. And the magazine was called The Sun. <laughs> um, other people started developing ideas. This unfortunately got closed down. Um, and just because coal was cheaper, it was, it was state funded though. Napoleon funded it as a, as a project and she sent the inventor off to Algeria where there was more sun. So I think it's a good example of how renewables as well as fossil fuels have a, have a history tied up in colonialism. It's very important that we remember that. Other uh, sort of solar entrepreneurs started building things up. There was this guy in Philadelphia around the beginning of the 20th century who managed to build a solar thermal plant in his garden. He used a liquid that had a lower boiling point than water, which meant it was more efficient. And he then went off to Egypt then because there's lots of sun. Uh, but that project kind of got 
sort of broken up by World War One and never really developed after that. We also see the first stages of what we'd call kind of solar PV now, so photovitalic cells, so a different way of producing electricity than turning a turbine that would generate electricity. Um, and that dates back again from the mid 19th century with people first experimenting. It actually came from a failed experiment to make better underwater cables to have for the telegraph cables that were going under, under the Atlantic. They were experimenting with different materials for that. And somebody found that selenium uh, had a higher conductivity under sunlight. And thought so that's no good at the bottom of the ocean, but maybe someone else would be able to make use of it. Wrote a paper in the 1870s and it got then picked up by some other people. It took a very long time before anyone actually built any kind of efficient solar cell though. Uh, so it wasn't until the Bell Labs in the 1940s, again sort of accidentally playing around this time with silicon, um, developed technology which became first the silicon chip and then also the first silicon PV cells. Um, the military got very excited about this. Um, this uh, they sent off their head of uh, one of their heads of energy research, who was a guy who'd come over from Germany um, with all the rocket developers. Uh, the Americans had decided that uh, this was a useful, uh, this these were useful brains, and so they pardoned uh, their their roles in in Germany in the war. Um, and he was very excited about all the different military uses of solar, and that they workshopped all the different possible things they could do with it, and realised the only place that would be any use at all was in space. But they were planning on launching a satellite. So we show the next slide, which should have a picture of that. It's Vanguard one, um, which was the the Americans got lost to the Russians to actually get a satellite up for International Geophysical Year in, a, in 1856. But when they did send one up, it was solar powered and this is it. And it's actually still up there. It's the oldest bit of space junk up in uh, the human produced space rubbish up in the sky. So maybe give it a wave next time you're using anything solar powered. To say something quickly about wind, uh, wind electricity started in Scotland, uh, very close to where Donald Trump had uh, big fights about an offshore wind uh, turbines and his golf courses, uh, fittingly enough. A guy called James Blythe, who was a um, lecturer in engineering at the Anderson College in Glasgow, which is sort of uh, early version of the University of Strathclyde, being set up as a kind of place for workers and also women to, to learn about uh, science and engineering. And he had a sort of holiday home back where he grew up on the west coast of Scotland, not far from Aberdeen. Um, and he built a wind turbine. Um, he tried to sell one to the local village, or give one actually, to the local village to power their streetlights, but they said it was the devil's electricity or the devil's work and uh, refused it. So he gave it to the local lunatic asylum where apparently it uh, powered uh, their lighting for several decades. Um, not long after him, there was another guy, this is 1887-ish with James Lyde. Not long after that was a guy called Charles Booth. So let's have the next slide, you can see Charles Booth's wind turbine. So he also built a wind turbine and this is it, it was in his um, a bit like William Armstrong, he was just a millionaire. He'd, he'd made his money actually in these arc lights, these very, very super bright electric lights, and was kind of retired to um, his big kind of uh, mil house on Millionaire's Row that he built. And in the front, he built this wind turbine. Um, you can see a person next to it, you can see how big it is. I think it looks a little bit like one of the monsters in Stranger Things. It's an incredible machine, but it fed into homemade batteries in his basement and all these jam jars and then lit uh, his home. Um, in, in Denmark, though, there was a guy called Paul Lacour who was doing some, uh, a slightly different approach to wind power. So he had worked in Telegraph and knew that electricity was going to be the future and was going to potentially transform people's lives in all sorts of ways. And he was really worried that it would mean that young people in Denmark would move to the cities. And he thought that that would destroy all sorts of parts, aspects of Danish life and traditions and Danish rural life. And there'll be a kind of movement from the countryside to the urban areas. And so he wanted to ensure that rural areas had this incredible benefit of electricity too, because he, he thought he came from an idea that electricity should be for all. It's a very different approach from some of the other entrepreneurs who are like, how could I make a lot of money about this or power my thing or impress my friends with my special thing. He was about bringing electricity to everyone. And he not only built and improved wind turbines in Denmark, but also trained up as many people as he could in building their own wind turbines and built networks for people to share training and ideas um, and systems and, uh, and materials. Uh, which was incredibly important for later when wind power blossomed in the, in the uh, 1970s. It was one of the reasons why Denmark was so able to cash in on things like extra subsidies that were brought out in California. Um, I just, uh, it was kind of, wind though was still quite small really until the middle of the 20th century. Um, there was also in America, it took quite a long time in the US 
for the rural areas to be electrified. Canada was much faster, as was parts of Europe, but it took a bit longer for America to really bother to, or for various reasons, to really um, bring electricity out into rural areas. The same thing that I guess uh, Paul Lacour had been worried about. So lots of people just built their own. And there was a lot of sharing of, uh, of, of techniques, a little bit like there had been in Denmark. And a, a, a couple of brothers, Joe and Marcellus Jacobs, built a factory that sold wind turbines and also sent one to Antarctica, where it was powered um, a station there for, for several decades. Um, but in, uh, it was in Russia that people really started to take wind to go big. So when Lenin, when uh, the Soviets took power, Lenin said, you will never have full communism until uh, we have full electrification and invested heavily in things like hydro. And they built some of the, the first really big wind. They built this in 1931. They built a 100 foot turbine near Bakuba um, and it was 100 uh, kilowatt. Um, sadly stopped in World War II and no one really knows what happens to it. They think it might have been used as a lookout station and then destroyed in a bombing. And then after the war, uh, Stalin didn't really invest in wind. But it inspired a guy in America called Palmer Put Putnam. Uh, and I think that's my last slide, which is his wind turbine, which sort of, unfortunately it's not a great photograph, it's quite old. Um, he decided he could do better than the Russians. He's like, well, whatever the rescue can do, we can do better. We can do 10 times better. Um, uh, the first megawatt and he built this enormous what was enormous for the time wind turbine on a, a, a mountain which has got a name that makes britain british people laugh it was called grandpa's knob it, it was a rather ridiculous undertaking but he was very charming and managed to somehow collect enough money to do it uh, he built it, it opened just before america joined the war and promptly broke again uh, and then stood still on the top of Grandpa's knob all the way through the war because no, everyone was too busy to go and fix this weird wind turbine. Uh, they eventually managed to fix it just after the war and then it broke again. And it broke this time incredibly dramatically with one of the blades flying through the sky and landing in front of Palmer Putson's feet. It was in the news uh, as the blade that failed and was very much seen as the reason why no one should bother with wind at all. And that's probably one of the reasons why people did really put renewables away along with a lot a lot a lot of hype about nuclear in the 50s uh, people really put renewables behind behind the scenes and though people would still have this kind of utopian idea that you know we stood we one day the future the space people will get their power from the sun they kind of thought in the meantime we've got fossil fuels and um, we should invest in renewables but in the 70s people did start coming back to it and uh, the work that palmer putnam did his investors made him write a book about everything that went wrong and this was incredibly useful and was one of the big inspirations for what then became the first wind farms and what we then saw is the sort of growth of what would be our modern wind industry that started really in the in the early 80s so that's a very short whistle stop tour of early renewables but um happy to talk more about them and anything about how it then kind of grew in the energy crisis and after that Alice, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm just going to ask you one really quick question and then I've got